Thank you, and I'm sorry, car. I'm about to talk about replacing at least your type of car with the new marriage of computers and cars that's coming. <coughs> and as the computer has taken over photography and music and some of the other industries, its change to transportation is going to be dramatic and amazing and truly world-changing, and I'm going to give you a taste of all of those different things. Four and five different pillars of change to society, but the most important one that I'll begin with is actually non-economic. It's the reason most people got into this, and it's the ability to save lives. We can save lives because human beings are not very good drivers. And every year around the world, we're killing 1.2 million people every year. That is the World Trade Center falling down every day. We are blind to it, and yet it is like one of the world's great diseases. With software, we have the power to cure it. In the United States, 38,000 people died last year in car crashes. Their safety agency put a cost on that of $870 billion, which works out to 29 cents a mile or 16 euro cents a kilometer, more than the cost of the benzene in your uh, drive, in your Hummer even. More for your share of accidents than for your fuel. Americans also spend, I calculated, 50 billion hours doing this. 50 billion hours. The entire productive labor output of the United States is 240 billion hours. And yet 50 billion of it gets spent on manipulating steering wheels. Now, here in Bulgaria, the number is smaller because the population and the number of cars is smaller, 708 dead and 8.9 thousand injured. But that is double the EU average, and it's one and a half times the rate per car that the United States has. Now, this is, in fact, one of the worst records in the European Union, so there's a lot to be fixed here in Bulgaria. However, you don't have to go too far outside the European Union to find a record that's almost three times as bad. So, <laughs> Okay, that's good. Some people said make fun of Romanians. Some people said make fun of Macedonians. Either way, the records are a little bit worse in those countries. Now, we can do something about this. 40% of, of these fatalities involve alcohol, and robots very rarely drink, which is one of their few advantages, not counting this famous Mexican robot. 25% of the energy output of big countries like the United States goes to ground transportation, cars. 25% of the greenhouse gases. And my favorite number I calculate is that the whole human race every year is driving 1.7 light years. How many of you use light years in your work as, as a unit of human activity? It's remarkable to think that that's how big the car is, and that's why everybody is getting in the game. Every car company, every high-tech company, all want to play in taking over a $5 trillion industry. That's trillion with a T. Now, every car company's in there. This year, Volvo has said they will have... Ah, oh, we have a little video problem here. But Volvo has said they will have 100 of their cars, customers in their cars, driving the ring road around Göteborg in Sweden, and in London, and also 100 more in China. We have seen Tesla release a software update to their car 18 months ago that owners woke up one morning, looked in the garage, and their car had an autopilot function, which wasn't a full self-driving car, but nonetheless could keep itself in the lane as they drove. A software update that arrived in the middle of the night gave them a limited self-driving ability. Um, here is BMW. You know, BMW's slogan, Freude am Fahren, or Joy of Driving, or the ultimate driving machine in the United States. This BMW concept car, if you look in the bottom left, it's got a bookshelf in the back seat, recognizing they might think of it as a living room rather than a driving machine. This is Ford's car, and Ford has said they will not sell this car to you. They were only going to make it for sale to taxi fleets. Companies like Uber and its competitors will buy this car, not you. Now, there is another German automaker that's actually got a problem with saying, trust your life to our software. Why would we lie to you? Um, now, that's funny, but... The truth is, that scandal may actually help VW. It may make them rethink themselves as a company faster than the other companies and get ready for this new world that's coming. Um, this is a vehicle from our high-tech neighbors in France. And once again, we do seem to have a, a little bit of a video issue coming up when they tested this. But this is a, um, 
well, it's now paused, but this vehicle has been for sale for three years. That's not a concept from the future or an announcement of a car that will come in 2020, like most car manufacturers have said, but something that's on the road, driving people around uh, uh, campuses, not going very fast and not going on the major streets. Um, this vehicle is running in Amsterdam, and last year all the major EU transportation ministers met and signed the Declaration of Amsterdam to change laws around the European Union to make sure this technology can happen quickly. Now, the Chinese are in the game, too. China's the number one car manufacturing country in the world now, and Baidu, their search engine, is much like Google is doing, making a self-driving car, and several other Chinese projects are underway. The Chinese can change their rules with the wave of a pen. They don't even need a, a nice EU committee to make it happen, and so this uh, might mean that they get to move a little quickly, too. Now, there are also startups, and that's what everyone here wants to know. Here's just a small raft of the startups, but one thing to note is that four of these startups have now reached unicorn valuations. Without products, without shipping anything, I was actually involved in getting three or four of them started and uh, didn't take any equity, damn it. But nonetheless, the valuations are very high and the excitement is very high in the startup space. Now, another company that has just finally revealed that they really are working on the space, there have been rumors for some time, is also building a car. And it's all very secret. They won't say anything about what's going on. I have learned one top secret thing about the Apple car. It will only work if you have a new iPhone. So, <laughs> You know, you're laughing, but it might not be a joke. We'll see what happens when that car comes out. Nonetheless, the leader, um, I worked on Google's car for a couple of years, one of the reasons I'm speaking to you today. Uh, and so I am biased, but I do believe it is the leader. They have now been driving for more than 4 million kilometers in self-drive mode on streets, mostly in California and some other American states. Uh, that's more than everybody else put together, and they've been at it the longest and have a very clever team. And they've made four generations of vehicles. Now, I do hope the video with audio I'm about to play will play, but this video will show you their third generation car, which is actually the most interesting. All right, we're going to get our AV team to possibly click on it and get it back to the beginning. There we go. Yep, go ahead. Okay, Annie, here we go. All right, Tommy, let's go. There's no steering wheel in the way. So if I had a self-driving car, I could spend more time. Ah, well, uh, the saying we have in this business is that AI turns out to be easy and it's AV that turns out to be hard. But nonetheless, hanging out with my this kids, vehicle represents a somewhat home. radical dimension. You saw the fact there was no steering wheel. I'll talk about a few other elements of it. Their fourth generation car is actually now in use in the city of Phoenix, Arizona, in the United States. Letting families use it as their daily transportation, taking their kids to football practice, taking uh, people to work. Families are actually doing a pilot project. This is real. This is on the road now. Now, this is built on a minivan rather than a custom design, so the doors open up and you get that sort of uh, chauffeur service. But this, things are going. Uh, another company that's building technology, in fact, there's been a lot of press about their battles with Google recently, is Uber. Now, of course, um, I, for some reason I couldn't take an Uber here in uh, Sofia, I'm not sure why. Um, but Uber has, in just six years, built everywhere but Bulgaria the world's number one brand in rides. And that's very important because the auto industry of the future is going to shift towards being much more about selling rides than selling cars, which puts them in a nice position at the forward. So they have that lead already, and they're trying to build the technology as well. They're not alone. The biggest competitor, Uber, in the United States, again, not here in Bulgaria, is Lyft. General Motors put $500 million into Lyft. Lyft has also done a deal with Google and some other players. General Motors also spent $700 million, almost unicorn valuation, to buy this company, Cruise, which, again, had never shipped a product, never really done anything, and they, in 18 months they got $700 million. This is General Motors getting into a panic and spending billions because they think they're too late. They think they've missed the game. This is not something from the 2030s that some people like to think. This is something happening now and putting car companies in panics for having missed the boat. The numbers, as I said, are staggering. Millions of lives billions of tons of CO2, trillions of dollars, 
all up for grabs because of what software will do to cars. And this is why I got in a true opportunity for programmers to save the world and change the world. On top of the vehicle, apropos to the vision section that we saw earlier on, is a LiDAR. This is the old one. There are newer and less expensive ones available now. LiDAR is a sensor that sees the world in 3D, and it's true 3D, not the 3D that you synthesize by having two eyes. You can see its view here, and we saw some other views, and once again, we're having a little bit of trouble with this. But here you can see the circular lines of the laser and these clouds of dots, which, while low resolution, you can tell are cars and trees and rocks and lines in the road, and so can the software. But this full 3D vision means it doesn't miss things to give us the reliability we need to get out on the road. I want you to also look at the inside of that Google third generation vehicle. She said there's no steering wheel, that's very obvious, no pedals. What else do you notice about the dashboard? It isn't there. There's no radio or climate control system or all the hundreds of buttons inside a typical car today. Google knows you don't want your music from your car. You're carrying your music in your pocket already. This is where I want mine, and they sell that, of course, but they won't mind if you use an iPhone. This is a different thinking. This is more of a living room, a working space, than it is a car. My favorite feature of this car, though, is the wing mirrors on the side. Um, no steering wheel, no brakes, but the law requires that all cars must have wing mirrors, and so it does. Step into this future with me. A world of what I call mobility on demand. You pick up your mobile phone, something rolls up to you very quickly, takes you where you want to go, if you're working, it has a desk and a screen. If you're with friends, it has a couch and a place to socialize. It's going on the roads we have now without changing the infrastructure at all. A very clever idea of making smart cars on stupid roads rather than trying to think that the roads will get smart. This is the vehicle that changes the world, does four things for us. Drive us around and keep us safer. We talked about that. Vehicles become something that are delivered to you. A cloud of transportation floats around you and comes to you when you need it. These vehicles also, when you're not in them, refuel or recharge themselves, and they store or park themselves. Now, those last three have big consequences, not just for our transportation, but for our cities and other industries like energy. Today, the car industry is driven by one big question. You go into a car dealership and you say, what car do I need for my life? What's the car that does everything? I sometimes have four people with me. I sometimes go up to the mountains to ski, and so I buy this and get a liter of milk in it most of the time. When that question changes from what car do I need for my life to what car do I need today, right now for this trip for the next 10 minutes, the answer is very different. If you're going skiing, the SUV is great. If you're going with a couple of friends, the two-seater is great, or the three-seater. If you're alone, which is 80% of the trips, the one-seater is the most efficient choice, something you would never buy today because it only meets about 80% of your needs. Suddenly, we shift what kind of cars we want and buy. We shift what powers them because robots don't care about how convenient it is to recharge or refuel with unusual fuel, which means that the 100-year head start that gasoline has is gone and suddenly, all the new fuels are possible, in particular electricity. If the Americans were to stop using gasoline for their urban trips, they would drop 200 million tons from their CO2 emissions every year, and they would no longer import oil from overseas. You've probably noticed the Americans have this pesky habit of going to war over the oil that they import. <laughs> Terrible habit. What an amazing thing for software to break them of it. So. You've all heard of Moore's Law in this room. I hope I don't have to explain it to you. But I do have to explain it to the auto industry because Moore's Law is coming to transportation because the computer is going to become the most important part of the car. Not the engine anymore, my friend. Not the nice leather seats. The computer and software will drive the value of the car, and they are on the Moore's Law curve, getting better every couple of years. Even what I tell you today will be obsolete if I talk to you again in just a year or two. And the industrial world has no concept of this. On the right, an ad for an electric car from 100 years ago. Today, we're finally starting to think about some electric cars. On the left, an iPhone 10 years ago that's introduced to the world. All of you have something like that in your pocket now. All of you had it five years ago. This is how the Moore's Law world attacks an industry and takes it over. So. Two different styles from the different companies. The car companies, the industrial world, 
is good at making cars, so the way they think of it is, let's make cars and put computers in them, make them better. But the high-tech world says, let's take computers and put wheels on them and see what happens. <laughs> well, it's the same goal. But the speed of innovation is different. The pace of change will be very different. And it will result in a different type of car. The most common car of the future, I think, will match the most common trip of the future, which means it will be small and electric with just a few moving parts, not the 10,000 we find in cars today. Few controls, no dashboard, but not just this car. There'll be cars of every type for every trip because the trip will be matched to the car. And this vision means different winners and losers in the automobile industry of these days. Let's talk about our cities as well. So we have a lot of these parking lots, and these cars don't have to park. If they're taxis, they drop you off and pick up someone else. If they're your car, they may wait for you, but they don't have to wait where they dropped you off. They can wait a kilometer away somewhere where there was spare space sitting waiting at a low price. That means we don't need all these parking lots, and we get to turn the parking lots into parks. Well, that's my dream. I know it's going to be condo towers in most cities. But nonetheless, this is not the only change to real estate. It was mentioned by the previous panel that real estate's the world's largest industry, and there's some arguments by which that's true. What is it about real estate that governs the value? The real estate people make a joke. They say it is location, location, and location. Well, I will tell you that a change in transportation will change the meaning of location. It will change the meaning of distance. Travel won't take any productive time out of your day. It'll be convenient. You'll be working or talking to friends. And so the travel times and the travel convenience will change, and so the meaning of location will change. This is not the first time this has happened. The city was re-architected in the 20th century by what? Him. And in the 19th century by the train, the trams. Every century we'll see a new type of transportation re-architect the city and what real estate is valuable and what real estate is not. And this is coming as well. So if the $5 trillion auto industry was not enough, or the oil industry, or the other industry I, I told you that would be turned upside down, we can add real estate to it. And then I'm going to add another industry. There is one product around the world which is so vital and important. We have built a giant infrastructure so that no matter where you are, no matter when it is, you can get it in 30 minutes or less. Right? <laughs> well, I'm working on a project with an Estonian company, and we are building delivery robots, not cars to carry people, but small robots to carry cargo. Hopefully we'll see the video. No, we won't once again. But oh, here we go. These robots, small and running on the sidewalk, will bring you anything in 30 minutes, not just a pizza. This is an easier project than carrying people. You can't kill a pizza. Right? You could ruin it, I suppose. And there I went to a restaurant the other night that did that without me carrying it in a robot. But nonetheless, imagine when stores can get you anything in 30 minutes for less than a euro. What does that mean for the future of retailing? Do you even need to own things when you can have them for rent in just 30 minutes by pushing a button on your phone? So the retailing and manufacturing industries are themselves also governed and will be controlled by what transportation does. So the list of industries goes on and on. Here is, in fact, a dozen industries. And I've covered a number of these, but I didn't talk to you about radio, which goes away if there's no drive time for you to listen to the drive time radio because your eyes are no longer tied up. Uh, construction industry and the buildings we make. Transit and airports change too. Airports are the interface between ground transportation and air, and revolutions in ground transportation will affect them. So the list is immense. It is a project on the scale of a moonshot. That's the metaphor we like to use at Singular University. And so talking about moonshot, the original moonshot was declared by President John F. Kennedy of the United States. So I'm going to butcher his words and tell you this. This nation should set itself the goal before this decade is out of a computer driving a man to lunch at noon and returning him safely to work. <laughs> All right, well, maybe not a good idea to have a Canadian do an impression of an American president to a group of Bulgarians. <laughs> but Kennedy said something else in those speeches which I really like a lot. He said some projects are worth doing not just because they're easy but because they're hard. And this is one of those. It's a difficult thing that everyone thought was science fiction, but brilliant teams are working on it, and they are going to change the world. Thank you very much.
Now, if somebody at the front has the briefest question, I will answer it. Nobody? Quick, you know, quick one hand? question, guys. One quick question. We're going to no. allow one. Yeah. Come on, take it. I left 30 seconds just for this, but Bulgarians don't ask questions, I guess. Is, is it? Who? Oh, well, there's one. Didn't okay. communism end a long time ago? There you ago? go. You know yes. what? Go on stage. It's going to be easier. There's a microphone there. Go on stage. All Next right. to Brad. But just tell me the question and I'll answer it. Oh, yes. Hello. Well, you already asked me a question, but go ahead. Uh, what's the most unexpected change that self-driving cars will bring? So, I think, I think, it, I think it's the re-architecture of cities that I told you about. I mean, the fact that <coughs> uh, the things that control how we live and how tall buildings are and the convenience of having things close to each other, I think seeing that change is something that nobody is ready for. So, thank, thank you, you Valentina. And thank you.